I'm glad we have slides. Slides are good. They are a necessary thing in the world. And Daniel's made some. So let's all of us gather round the 21st century campfire, which is, of course, the slide deck, and have us a wholesome good time. How interesting that you would phrase it that way, because fire is going to come up in our story. Hello and welcome to this bonus episode of Because Language, a show about linguistics, the science of language. My name's Daniel Midgley. Let's meet the team. With me now, my two wonderful podcast princesses. Princess number one, Hedvig Hirgard. Hello, Hedvig. Hi. Hi. Having a good morning? I've got my cup of tea. Um... As listeners and my podcast hosts will know, I'm not the best morning person, but I am applying myself. It will be great. All right. And princess number two, Ben Ainsley. Hey, Ben. I want everyone to imagine that I'm doing that weird, regal, so my hand doesn't get tired wave. The like the curve from side to side. Yeah, exactly. Well, um, uh-huh. that's that's true princess style, right? I don't even want to put in the effort to look exuberant. Well, but if you're a rodeo princess, then it's this kind of thing. I've never seen a rodeo princess. Uh-huh. I've never been one, but I have seen them. <laughs> uh, um, and, you know, people don't have to imagine how your wave looks like, because for this episode, there's two ways to do this. You can listen to the regular way on audio, and that's great. But there's also slides for this episode, which you will be able to see if you flip over to our YouTube channel and watch the video version of this episode, which has slides and us waving. (gasps) (laughs) In a regal manner. So you can find a link to the video in the description for the audio episode that you're listening to now. Hey, Hedvig, why are you in Sweden? Mm -hmm. I've been been meaning to ask. Oh, I'm in Sweden because I'm... um... I'm here studying a Department of Linguistics and Philology at the Uppsala University and doing some research and doing some teaching. That's, listen to that, guys. That's the life of a career academic. Ooh, soak it in. She's made it. Uh, it's fun. I get to teach in, in Swedish and uh, the students are really lovely. Um, yeah, they're very sweet. They're all having fun. We're in that part of the intro to linguistics where you have to talk about like, so the retroflex part of the palate is the oh. place where it tickles the most. So everyone put your fingers into your mouth. And they're like, oh. <laughs> and I'm like, no, 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 trust me. <laughs> and then like, and then put your fingers on your Adam's apple and then put your fingers on your nose. It's a lot of touching. I, I've encouraged them to clean their hands afterwards. <laughs> Teaching first years is the best. I love it. I'm so envious. Have fun with it. It is really fun. Uh, so before we talk about the ancient and distant past of historical linguistics, do we have some news to check in with? No, but we do have uh, some patron thanks. I'd like to thank you for being a patron. You are helping us to keep the public episodes public for everyone. Also, a bit of housekeeping. Watch your mail, because I just dumped about 200 envelopes into the post box. I think it was a post box. Pretty sure it was a post <laughs> box. <laughs> some poor person's like... Shopping trolley just has a lot of mail. Um, You would not believe, like, as a person having a bike with um, a bike basket, people put all kinds of stuff into your bike basket. (laughs) Recycling. Usually trash, yeah, various kinds of trash, and it's like... Is it ever kittens? Does, like, the cat distribution system ever work that way? She said trash. Mainly takeaway coffee mugs. Uh, That's less exciting than kittens. Well, it was a post box because some patrons are already getting their annual mail out with patches and our postcard and stickers and stuff. Now, Ignacio and I figured out something. Ignacio, of course, gave us the idea for our etymology sticker. So thanks, Ignacio. I've been telling people, make sure Patreon has your address, but there's a little problem. Even if you have given Patreon your address, it's possible that Patreon won't show it to me. Because when you signed up, there's a tick box that says, I don't want any physical mail. So Uh. if you've ticked that box, Patreon will not show me your address and you won't get the mail out. So here's what you do. Climb into Patreon, see if you can find a tick box like that and untick it. 
And if you have any doubts about your mail, that your mail out is coming or not, give it a little while. Give it a, give it a week or two, depending on where you are. But if you're worried, just slip me a quick email. Hello at becauselanguage.com. I was going to say, yeah, if you don't want to, if you don't want to untick the junk mailbox, which to be perfectly honest, I wouldn't want to untick either. <laughs> just, just send Daniel your address because yeah, he's going to get it anyway. Yeah. And you know, if you're not sure, I've got the list of everybody that I've sent the mail out to. I'll just say, oh yeah, you're on the list. You're fine. Or no, you're, just go ahead. It doesn't matter. It's fine. It'll be a quick one. Anyway, we hope that you like the stuff we sent. We had fun putting it together. Thanks for being patrons and sticking with us. And if you're listening to this later, we need you become a patron now at patreon.com slash because lang pod. Okay. I think it's time that I share the slides. Slide decks. Oh, bah, 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 class bah, 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 is bah. in session, kids. I'll say. Let's take a look at what happened last time. We looked at what language was like at ever-increasing time depths. We looked at language one year ago where we mostly talked about large language models and Wordle. Those were the, the big things. There was some vocab. That was fun. Ten years ago, we started looking at emoji and gender-inclusive language. About a hundred years ago, we looked at modern English, the rise of modern English, and also pronouns. About a thousand years ago, then we were talking kind of the transition from Old English to Middle English. And then we went to 10,000 years ago where we started talking about Proto-Indo-European, uh, Austronesian language family, and uh, how we reconstruct languages. Did we get that about right? Yep. That was our, that yep. was our whistle-stop tour. Hmm. Yeah. So this time we're going to take a look at even deeper time scales, and then afterwards we're going to take the time machine into the future a bit and do some speculation. It's going to be real fun. Ooh. Yeah. Okay. We are on 100,000 years ago, and the first thing that we'd like to do is say, well, what kind of things can we use to figure out what language was like 100,000 years ago? I've got archaeological records. Hedvig, what yeah. else? Yeah, so archaeological records can be interesting. It can tell us maybe about culture. So if people have a similar kind of art form in different areas, then maybe they're related and we can hypothesize. But it's hard to hypothesize about the actual features of languages. So there is some research where people actually try to like scan mummies and stuff and try and reconstruct vocal tracts, but not usually as far away as 100,000 years ago. 100,000 years ago, we're talking potentially um, before everyone left Africa, right? Mm -hmm. That's so, right. going to be my question, right? Is where right. are humans 100,000 years ago? Because I'm, yeah. I'm pretty sure we're not in the what we now call the Americas, for example. Mm -hmm. I don't no. think we're in Australia yet. Would we be mm -hmm. on the Asian continent, possibly? Let's talk about that. So um, the first thing that I want to bring up is when did language arise? And we've got a number of sort of bins that we can set as hard limits or events that seem to be language-ish. So let me just bring these up and then we can hash this around a little bit. Five to seven million years ago, that's MYA, we see speciation of chimps and humans. We talk, they don't. We sign, they don't. And so mm -hmm. I think that's kind of an earliest possible limit of when we would say, okay, language now. Right. But it's, I mean, a lot of the conceptions we have about what defines human language is defined sometimes a little bit ad hoc. We're trying to cut out specific other species. So we're like these like hawker design features or something. A lot of them are targeted at like excluding bees, excluding parrots, excluding, um, you know, primates and stuff. But if we, if we, if we remove that kind of like, we need humans to be special glasses and instead just ask what are different communication styles? What are different modes of communication and what are different animals trying to do? Then um, there are a lot of things actually in common just because they don't have like arbitrary signs and blah, blah, blah. They still have a lot of things in common. I, I got a, um, to prepare for this, um, episode I emailed with some people and I emailed with Dan Dedu and he said in just a personal note like I would not be shocked if even one million years ago people use something similar ish eerily similar to what we now um to what we do now but we can't ever know because we can't really uh, find any evidence of it but right so this this person's point was 
if you were to take a time machine a million years ago, you would see a thing that would be functionally indistinguishable from finding some undiscovered tribe today and hearing their language kind of thing. Like it, it no, would... maybe, maybe it wouldn't be indistinguishable, but it would probably still work as a complicated communication system. So maybe the utterances right. would be smaller, fewer phonemes, maybe they wouldn't, you know, it would be different, but maybe it would still be a complicated communication system. Why are but we, we like... have that spectrum in our languages on earth today anyway, right? Like there are languages with far fewer phonemes than others, correct? Right. But we're talking maybe even less than that. Yeah, yeah. So the ones we find today are actually pretty, I mean, they're a bit different, but they're... I'm really glad you're mentioning this, Hedvig, because I really have come to think quite differently about this. It used to be, because I was pretty influenced by the Chomsky and Syntactic school, though I didn't want to be, I would say things like, oh, well, we can say that uh, it's language when, and then we go to Hockett's design features like, oh, they take their utterances, break them down and build them up to make new ones, syntacticity or something. And I'm I'm just not sure that that's, that's what we're looking for here. Like if you think that Maybe. language arose because we got a specific brain mutation that allowed us to do abstract symbolic manipulation, then that you're gonna come up with one answer. But I just think of language as like, I don't want to say a spectrum, but it's, I don't think of it as like syntactic. I think of it as in terms of Morton Christensen and Nick Chater, we've just all been playing language-y games for a super long time. Yeah. And if you think of it that way, then language could have arisen many times or things that are kind of like language have arisen many times along the way, and it could happen again because we're all just playing this improvisational game and language is the buildup of these games. The point, the point of language, or at least one point of language seems to be to coordinate social action. So like I say something and I want you to have a certain thought in your head and then learn or say something else. Like that's the game that we're playing. The other potential function of language is that it's like about organizing your thoughts, that it's like an internal thing and then like secondarily an external thing that you talk to other people. But I think it's probably mainly talking to other people. And a lot of other social species need to communicate with each other. And we've probably needed this also. And, and other primates, okay, maybe they don't do like exactly all the fancy things we do, but they do a bunch of cool stuff. So mm -hmm. it's probably like... They probably did something. What are we up to now on our time machine? A hundred thousand? Yeah. No, no, no. Um, we're at five. We're at five million. We're, we're just taking a, a a short look back, a quick look back. We're going to stay in the hundred thousand camp. But um, I I just want to say this. It um, just like giraffes, where at some point there were pre giraffes and then there were giraffes, and one day there's going to be post giraffes, and we come along and we say, oh, giraffe now. Um, we do the same thing with language. We say language now, but there's been elements that have floated in and things that are floating out and language, whatever we've been doing, we come along and we say, oh, at this point it's language, but that's might be kind of arbitrary like giraffes. So the the idea being, if I'm, if I can boil both of you down. Yes, please. Um, yes. To, a, to, a, to a lay person. That's your job. <laughs> yeah. There's a bunch of creatures on the planet who, and we've said this before in other shows, who are doing like proto languagey things they're doing language like things because they have the same suite of needs that humans have that probably gave rise to language in the first place like so social coordination and a repertoire that allows them to do some of that stuff too yeah. so the the sort of the point here is if we were to be able to give octopuses and dolphins and chimps and you know, bees and put whatever animal you want in here that's doing language-like things right now, parrots. If we gave all of these animals another couple of million years, maybe they would start, they would sophisticate the language-like things they're doing into something that would be more like a language, but possibly not like our language because they would follow a different path. And then they would probably have a bunch of their own rules being like, well, well I think you'll find that what the humans do is not in fact language <laughs> because it is only yeah, us who do yeah. real language. I mean, maybe, maybe those, those, those gross hairless monkeys with their weird mouth squawking, they can't manipulate their tentacles like a real person can. Yeah, no, for sure. And um, like, if you imagine some uh, an, a group that has a very different social organization to most like mammals, if you imagine like, ants mm. 
and they for some reason which honestly like you have to realize that evolutionary like evolution doesn't have a goal right yeah, yeah. it just solves the it's problem in front of it die. yeah exactly it's not die um it, it's good if you're not in pain but it's not as important as not dying so you can be in a lot of pain and still. only to the point of reproduction as well that's really crucially important to remember as well like and, fuck, and then die fine <laughs> maybe for some social species it's good to have some people around to babysit when yeah, yeah but um but ants but have a very different like they have the members of their species for example have very very different bodies depending on their functions and they would be like oh of course um the worker ants could never wave their antenna that way that would be gross um of course only <laughs> the queen can do that or something and they'd be like humans a bunch of queens don't have talking this. to each other yeah humans don't have this special feature that's like all of their species can talk to each other it's super gross like i don't know let's be clear i'm not saying that squid have their own kind of language but no, no i'm no. thinking of language nowadays I know as, that. as as <laughs> Well, let me put it this let me let me talk about the way that i visualize it and maybe you can tell me if you think so you know how wittgenstein okay. talked about family resemblances when he was talking about games like some games right. have a goal some games don't some games use equipment some games don't we have this category of game but an individual game doesn't have to have all of the attributes instead it's like a grab bag of things that we come along and say oh that's a game maybe language has family resemblances to other kinds of things that other animals are doing and we just put the label language on it yeah for sure for sure anyway. and also like if if, if bonobos don't need to talk about like what they did yesterday and the imagined universe then they're not going to involve the ability to do i mean the fact that we are doing it is like they're way too busy masturbating anyway also, like, honestly, Ben, like, how much joy has all this civilization brought you personally? Oh, I, <laughs> Tons. You Tons. are preaching to the choir, right? Like, I like, like twice as long as I would have normally. I th see o only on average, Daniel, right? So that's an important factor to remember. Yes. I actually imagine one of the hardest things in the world to be would be either an anthropologist or an archaeologist, right? When you are just constantly confronted with this information that human beings actually probably had much happier lives. <laughs> and then we fucked it. And shorter. All up. Well, anyway, yeah. let's let's move it along and talk about sort of some other events that people could say, well, okay. People might say, oh, language began here, or maybe a wave of stuff happened that contributed to our language. Which I think is more likely. Right. 1.6 to 1.8 million years ago, we know that there was Homo ergaster and they were using tools. Tool making is very important. We know that when you stick somebody in an fMRI machine and you have them imagine tool making, guess what lights up? Broca's area. Right. Okay, so also Homo erectus crossed oceans, managed to make it to other places. Um, hard to imagine without the kind of brain that would be able to do language. And also, yeah, and not just because tool making, but also because you need a group of people. Yeah, you need you probably social can't cross organization. Your own. You need to be like, okay, everyone, we're going to get on this boat. And we're going to be on this boat for a long time. And it's going to be miserable, but hopefully there's something fun over there. Just to be clear to all the listeners as well, like obviously many animals can cross the ocean. What we're talking about is the fact that Homo erectus and us are not well suited for that task. So we would need <laughs> a lot of organizing to pull it off. Yeah. By the time we get to 150,000 to 200,000 years ago, that's KYA, thousand years ago, we start seeing that humanoid fossils look a lot like us. We had the same body. I'm not going to say lockdown, design lockdown, but I am going to say, yeah, we looked a lot like we do now. And this is where we also get into um, the potential um, cousin of ours, Neanderthals, which everyone yes. in the show has a little bit probably of DNA of. So when we talk about Homo erectus and stuff, we talk about we talk we we say that we talk about species, but we know that there were other Homo things running around at the time that we could interact with, um, and that maybe had something languagey. We don't know, but anyway, some of us had um, what's it called in The Sims? Woohoo time! Um, Scoodly pooping. <laughs> Got Daniel. Scoodly pooping, right? 
Um, and they were around in parts of Eurasia about 300,000 uh, years before Christ. So we're talking about four, uh, it's 2,000 years, who cares? It's about 300,000 yeah. years ago um, uh, until about maybe 30,000 years ago, something like that, I think. And then they're no longer, and they only live on in us. And mm. if we are lucky, maybe we can do a... What, what, I've seen various figures. Do you, does anyone know what we've settled on? It's like we are roughly 1.5% to 2% Neanderthal. Is that how that works? It's if you are... Um, you have origins from outside of sub-Saharan Africa as well. Oh, okay. Because their because their gene lines are clean. They never scoodily pooped with the uh, <laughs> with the with the bad ones. <laughs> and it's it's not like a lot. And um, well, I share a workplace. I'm in the same institute as Santa Pablo, who just received a Nobel Prize for research that has to do with this stuff. So maybe I shouldn't talk out of my hat. I should. I should. We should prepare and talk thoroughly about it, but. Get, the get the clever people on the show. If we're talking about bonobos being able to do some sorts of communication and other primates, Neanderthals were more like us than bonobos, and probably we know that I, I believe that we uh, think that they had um, burials, like they buried people, right? Burials, yes. Hey, and then we've got uh, fifty to seventy thousand years ago humans out of Africa, which I think we might be able to say is the latest that we're going to. But that's going to be a, a late limit although if you think that language like the, the argument is that language arose in africa and then we all took it with us as we dispersed but again if you think that language could happen through innovative language games then it doesn't have to be oh, no. then it could be even later so no no i don't think it could be later because no. it takes a while for it to reach that level of sophistication and complex complexity and i don't think there's enough time from going out of africa to now to get to it so it's I, it's gotta we took gotta we be. took language alongside spears and fire out of africa yeah yeah there's no way i'm leaning toward the 150 to 200. i'm i'm leaning toward the green one personally i that's that's where i go but again doesn't have to be a thing where before this there was no language, after this there was. It could be there were waves and we added things to our repertoire and everybody's using their repertoire to get themselves across. And like we said, Homo erectus crossed oceans like a million years before that point. So there was something language-like almost certainly happening just by virtue of that feat. The counter argument is that they got washed to sea and survived after the tsunami. Okay, okay, cool, cool, cool. <laughs> what's like i'm sorry what like let's just apply occam's razor to that one a little bit like what is one is someone won the lottery and the other one is based on the evidence that we see it's pretty likely that this thing happened like it's <laughs> okay yeah maybe just for our listeners we should say we're getting into time that's here where like as you can notice by us being like oh, oh, oh we have very little like it's it's hard to know it's yeah. hard to know it's hard to know um and it's probably gradual some of these things so would we say we hedvig because i feel like you're the closest to this that mm. many people spend their entire lives trying to answer small aspects of these questions oh my god yeah 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 tool making um crossing oceans uh types of culture like dance um like decorations of tools like all these things that we think have to do with a social group and social communication that can leave some sort of evidence in in like archaeological remains because like brains don't fossilize and even if yeah. they do like we don't know how to and language certainly doesn't the spoken <laughs> word doesn't get trapped in mud no nope. no but like little prints into clay does yeah. and like yeah. mm. why would people be printing stuff into clay if they didn't have some sort of social meaning building system right why would why would you create like carvings and paintings of of things if you didn't tell each other stories mm -hmm. right but then we also have other animals who have like fashion right so like various <laughs> animals every now and then there's a uh, animal news that like oh all of these birds pick up this leaf and put it on their left side and they're all like really into this right now it's mm. so, like they also do social signaling with visual means so like well, we've uh, taken a lot more time on this slide than i was planning to <laughs> but i'm Come i'm on. really glad really? we do because this is like a long yeah kind of um you thought what did you think <laughs> 
<laughs> you can't have just you met, dump this kind have, of chum like, into the water and not expect us to go wild. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> okay, well, having looked at this overview, let's plant ourselves firmly into the 100,000-year-ago camp. We're pretty okay. sure, like I'm, I'm taking the view that we had language or something very, very language-like uh, by 100,000 years ago because early humans were very similar to us physically and genetically. We all had bodies that were capable, and it seems weird to have that kind of hardware if you're not already using it, unless you're using it for something else, which is possible. You mean hardware as in speech organs? Yes, and brain structures. Right, but yeah. yeah. And abilities. They're probably not used for... Yeah. yeah. We'll talk more okay. about those mm -hmm. a little later. Um, okay. Another thing, they were able to coordinate their activity. They were able to hunt cooperatively, which doesn't always require language, but it helps if you have it. They were able to migrate out of Africa somewhere between 50 and 80,000 years ago, which seems, and this is where the language has to be very weak. We have to say weak things like, it seems very difficult for them to have been able to do that stuff without language, but they still could. Can I also put forward one idea here? Because I always see hunt cooperatively laid down. Mm -hmm. um, I, I have so much experience in studying early humans, so obviously this is a very important thing that carries a lot of weight. <laughs> but can we acknowledge that all of the other things that humans do would also require language and be really difficult, right? Like if you are preserving and storing food supplies for, like, say, mm -hmm. a winter season or something like that, or if you are gathering a certain thing that needs to be treated in a certain way, otherwise it like mm -hmm. kills you. And it, after you treat it, it becomes food. Like all of mm -hmm. that stuff requires language. It's it's so not just hunting stuff. Hmm. Also, a lot of other social species hunt cooperatively, like wolves do. Yeah, and lions. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Wolves and so ravens. So it can't, right? Mm -hmm. right? So like, I'm, I'm more in the cultural um, decoration, burial, like those things seem unusual and seem to require not only communication systems but also the idea of like social units and meaning and signaling and stuff like that that is more interesting to me than so the thing that but, i yeah. come to with migrating out of africa is that you need the capacity you need to be able to have essentially like a calorie bank to pull that off and you definitely definitely need to be able to do that if you want to go into places that freeze for half of the year right you need to have the faculties to build up and then use a supply of food and, and mineral mat materials and that sort of thing. And humans didn't have it because in Africa you didn't need it. And then to do it, we probably very much needed language. But that goes back to Daniel's point, right? We don't know that for sure. We just have to say, man, that would be really tough if we couldn't talk to each other. It suggests that we had brains capable of it, at least, if we, even if we didn't use it. But are we kind of all on board that 100,000 to 200,000 years ago, Something very much like language was going on. Are we cool with that? I think so. Okay. Uh, Hedvig, yeah. you okay with that? Yeah, and that, that it might have existed for even longer than that, but at that, that point, we would have had to have that. Yeah. Okay. Like it's, it, there's like a bottleneck, right? Like Yeah. Control P, you know, control L to have language to get past this point. Okay. And to be clear, like we're talking about the origins that we all come from Sub-Saharan Africa, but not from all parts of Sub-Saharan Africa, right? It's more like Eastern Africa. And it's not like all those areas are like full of calorie foods and super easy to navigate either. Like True. there's deserts right? and so, like, difficult things. Yeah. It was not like we didn't have a challenge before we tried to like <laughs> go through Egypt. Like we must have had a challenge all along. I've seen a few nature documentaries about Africa and Whilst I don't want to give them like too much credit, I, I feel very confident in saying there are hard, scary things that exist in Africa that being a human being around would have been hippos, man. Holy oh. fuck. Oh, they're terrifying. That just, oh. Even an ostrich would send me scurrying up a tree. And hippos don't even need to eat you. Right? Like, they're not interested. They're not going to eat you. They're not a predator, you. but they, that, like, that almost makes it worse. Like, they'll yeah. just be walking along being like, vegetables, 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 and then they clock a human and they're like, absolutely uh, not. that thing. <laughs> That's just not it. No. Let's talk about how language started. And <laughs> there are lots of ideas mm -hmm. and they have fun names, like the ding-dong hypothesis. You see something, <laughs> you're trying to make the sound, ding-dong. 
language as onomatopoeia. And then once you get that, then you got words and then you can go from there. Otto Jesperson so, was a big so ding donger. Apparently, like this this theory clearly by a New Yorker. Bing bong! There it is. <laughs> Closely related, the Bow Wow hypothesis, where you're trying to imitate the sounds of animals, that gives you words, and then you can... By the way, these weren't considered to be mutually exclusive. The Uh-Oh hypothesis, where language started as warnings. Fall! Die! Kill! And the Heave Ho hypothesis, where people tried to use language to coordinate joint action, which is a very languagey thing. And so you've got to roll a gigantic rock off of something... And so you all work together, uh, 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 and so now you're using vocalizations to coordinate joint action. Just as a very quick aside, everyone, if you mm-hmm. haven't, give there's a wonderful little indie video game called Heave Ho. It's a party game. It's a cooperative game. It's great fun. Everyone should give it a try. Uh, on that note, I I I favor the Heave Ho hypothesis. Okay, Just sort of intuitively. Like, yeah, not because of the game, but because. Doing stuff together is hard. Like anyone who's ever done one of those team building exercises where you have to achieve a task and everyone's either like blindfolded or or gagged or whatever is so difficult. Yeah. It's really challenging. Yeah. I think that these different hypotheses are, are like mapping onto different things. Some of them, like warnings and coordinate action, both have to do with the idea that there is an interest in being a member of a group and that the group needs to function well. The onomatopoeia and animal noses are just like the origins of the particular things. So I feel like mm-hmm. these could also be combined, right? Like the right. warning so thing like could be onomat- happened as part of yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah that's so they're, right. they're a bit different. And then also like when we hear heave ho, maybe we think about like doing big things, but there are a lot of things that go on in social groups that aren't like building houses. I remember we talked a while ago on this podcast about this uh, study of I think it was bat living in a colony was that ring a bell or was it naked mall rats one of them and i think it was <laughs> bats but like but two two delightful looking creatures <laughs> they were really living close to each other and the researchers thought that most of their communication was like your butt is in my face that's right it was move. complaints <laughs> this sucks why is it so dark i hate being a bat <laughs> No, but no, but honestly, like yeah, just being that. next to each other and being like, can you scoot over a bit? Like you smell <laughs> and like, I would like to be closer to the fire. And like, there are a lot of yeah. little things that need to work for a social group to work. Not all of them are these like. Your, your fire is too smoky. Can you sort it out? Cause it's like smoking out the camp. That's mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Not even only complaints, but maybe not. I think, I think of like your belt is in my face as coordinate action. Yeah, I agree. Hey, there are a lot of other hypotheses like this, and if you want to find out more, if you're on the audio version, flip over to the video version, uh, you'll see something I've got on the screen, an article called Linguistic Hypotheses on the Origins of Language. That's in the show notes. In fact, all of the graphics that you're seeing, they're in the show notes for this episode, so check that out, becauselanguage.com. Now, let's keep on going. Um, In the 1800s, linguists loved debating these origins of language, and they didn't have any good ways of knowing which one or ones were correct or how they interlocked. So in 1866, the Linguistic Society of Paris banned any discussion of language (laughs) origins. It's like, oh, no, 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 no. Hang on. No, we're not doing that. Shut up. That's what it was like. Because it just caused far too much ruckus. I'm afraid so. And also not only far too much ruckus, but they also thought that like it wasn't going anywhere. Right, mm-hmm. Like it's a fundamentally unanswerable question. Yeah. They're like, this is just taking up time and it's not, we can't know, we can't falsify it, we can't test it. So like, mm-hmm. It's like at a, at a work meeting when someone starts talking about like something that's already happened or something like that and yeah. everyone in the room is just like, Carl, no, shut up. No. <laughs> in a hundred <laughs> years, go for your life. But for now, just cork it. Now- it's a good time to talk about signed languages because people have sometimes asked, wait, was it gesture or was it sound or was it both? Do we switch over at some point? And the probable best answer is the gesture was happening at the same time as sound because we were just using our repertoire and our repertoire is a lot of things. People used what they had to create and transmit meaning. And we find that signed languages are f- full languages with their own grammar. 
Uh, they are not debased versions of spoken languages or gestural versions of spoken languages. And our brains treat signed and spoken language alike. And we can also tell this by the fact that people who aren't deaf also use gestures accompanying signs. So I am back in Sweden in my hometown and I was talking to some of my old high school friends and I was like, Edvin, and then I pointed to where his mom and dad and him used to live. Because that's how I distinguish which Edwin I'm talking about, right? And you do that all the time with spoken languages as well, like using your hands or your eyebrows or other parts besides your speech organs to communicate is not something entirely confined to sign languages. We do that all the time. If you've ever tried to like tell an Italian person to speak without moving their hands, you'll learn. Anyone. It's hard it's for hard. us to stop waving our hands around when we're talking. I'm very bad yeah. for it. Kids, when they want to make fun of me in class, will mimic my hand gestures as I'm talking. And it is one of the most authentically distracting and derailing things a human being can do. <laughs> I doff my hat for their creativity, but at the same time, it's so annoying. Okay, we're going to leave 100,000 years ago. We're climbing back into the machine. We're going back to a million years ago, which we have kind of already Ooh. talked about. So let's go deep. The things we can use, we can use information about human bodies because we know that at this point we all had similar bodies, at least probably. We can use information about human settlements and we can use research from this wonderful resource called the CHIELD database. CHIELD, started by our pal Sean Roberts and some others. I have contributed to it and people can contribute to it. It's a wonderful thing. Basically what it is, it is a database of lots of different papers on both language origins, but also language change. Like not, not, we're not necessarily only about these kind of timescales. In fact, they're not super common, but um, what you can do there is you can sort of visualize different people's scientific arguments in graphs. So if people say that, for example, in order to have language, you need to, um, you need to have your speech uh, apparatus needs to look a certain way. Then you can get a little graph with two nodes that say like speech organs look this way and language and a little arrow. What you can do on Shield is you can look at lots and lots and lots of different papers in this way and sort of see how their arguments hang together because reading people's papers is sometimes tricky and sometimes you wanna compare many papers at the same time. So I yeah. can really recommend going and exploring Shield. People who do work like this are doing the Lord's big time, big time, big, big time. I decided to zoom in on one and it's fire control. Now what you're seeing hey, on the- Hey, we're back at fire. Yeah, we're back. We made it back. So what we're seeing in this chart that I've got here is there's a, a bubble with fire control in there, but it's also got lots of links to other things. And I'm just going to read some out other bubbles like warmth. I'm starting at nine o'clock, uh, foraging strategy, fuel. Lightning, it's related to fire control. Uh, extended day, night light. I'm going to go over to uh, three o'clock, wildfire, social interaction, hmm. fire transport, cooking. There's just all kinds of things that people in various research papers have linked to fire control when it comes to language and language development. And like uh, Ben was talking about, like being able to extend calorie resources by drying or cooking them and make them edible, make things that aren't edible, edible. So uh, all like just the idea of fire is actually a complicated scientific concept that you can tease apart in these type of graphs. Mm -hmm. And not only that, but um, ancient humans, are we still talking to, uh, maybe I should have said this at the start of this section. A million years ago, are we still talking about Homo sapiens or have we moved into one of our progenitor people? I think we're not at Homo sapiens yet. I think we're pre-Homo okay. sapiens. So there as well, I think we need to acknowledge that fire is actually really complex. I think people have this idea that, um, like, it's this, it's, it's very much tied to like white supremacy and colonialism, all this kind of thing. That like making fire is this like primitive, savage thing, and all that kind of stuff. To oh. to have figured this thing out, right, which is to say, fire required an incredible scientific mind or minds, right? Because it probably got discovered a bunch of times by a bunch of different people. Um, and it's not like, I don't know if anyone has ever actually gone out and tried to make a fire by scratch. I have. I have. It's extremely hard. It's not like, Even if you know what you're doing and even if you have all the, the right tools and all that kind of stuff, it's not an easy undertaking. 
And the people who figured out how to do it and figured out how to do it reliably and could control it really, really well, like we spoke a second ago about how migrating out of Africa required a fair bit of coordination. Uh, this too, I think, mm -hmm. would be a yeah. strong piece of evidence as to why humans would need language just to coordinate because making and controlling fire is a very hard thing to do. And once you've made a fire, you probably want to coordinate as a group to keep it sustained. Also, oh. like even when you have matches, like I'm in Sweden right now and most of the houses, uh, the rooms that I'm in in this house have this thing that you don't have in Australia, which is called a tiled fireplace. Yep. They're lovely. You make a fire in them, they uh, heat up and they heat you throughout the night. I tried to make a fire in it with like matches, paper and wood that is dry. Like tinder, kindling, all of it. <laughs> All of it. And I wasn't good at it. And I had to be like, Mom, Mom, can you come make the fire in my room? Because I suck. And she's like, okay. <laughs> Let me talk my way around fire here for a second. If you've got control of fire, that means people gather together in social groups. So now you've got a group of individuals who are in a social setting. And while the fire is going, you know, it's dark at night, what are they doing? Well, they're sitting around, they're telling stories, they're making, uh, they're talking to each other, they're communicating, they're nurturing, feeding young, forming bonds. There's all kinds of stuff that's language-like going on there. As you mentioned, uh, Hedvig, it, it means that humans can cook food. And that means that you can make non-edible things edible. It allows you to pre-digest food. You can unlock proteins that wouldn't have been uh, ordinarily available, which means you get more nutrition out of food and that feeds a human brain. Let's just take a look at what's going on around the cooking. Cooking connects to anatomy, cooperation, nutrition, resident system, parental investment, food storage, sociality. There's so much going on here. So can I ask, about the human brain, because we talked about food, calorie surplus, human brain size, blah, blah, blah. We've spoken before, we've mentioned it already in this show, broker's area is the thing that fires up when you think about tool making. We didn't mention it at the time, but broker's area is also the thing that fires up when you do languagey things. But broker's area, if I'm not mistaken, is not like one tiny little clump in the brain, right? When we do language, a whole bunch of different areas all around our brain, and when I say around our brain, I mean like physically separated within our brain mm -hmm. all coordinate and fire off and do things right mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. okay again not an expert but our brain size is not cheap <laughs> this it's like, so from, much sugar right from an from an uh from a evolutionary perspective having our brains the size and complexity of ours is not a small energy expenditure for us. So we need to get something out of it. Cause like Hedvig said, evolution don't give fuck about like what happens to us other than living long enough to have babies and have those babies live long enough to have more babies and all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Part of the reason we have such a big brain is because we can do language, but because we can do language, we can get all of these things that allow us to have such a big brain. Yep. So I think the point I'm trying to make here is um, the control of fire, which allowed us to get like a calorie surplus is a huge reason why sort of it reinforces that cycle of like, yes, absolutely. We have huge energy intensive brains because having the huge energy intensive brains allows us to control fire and allows us to do funky things with food, which gets some small calories mm. so we can have bigger brains and so on and so on and so on. And so on. <laughs> yep. Yep. yep, like, yep. Of course we can talk. Let's zoom in on brain size for a second because the chilled graph has lots of things for brain size like prop i'm starting at uh, 12 o'clock propositional knowledge communication group size uh gestures hand gesturing down at six o'clock social intelligence iconicity population size there's a lot going on but, but wait the wait we we know that like the the sheer size of your brain so for example big animals have lar larger brains I, I was going to ask this as well right like a blue whale has a huge brain yep because it needs to control a big body right so like it's not just that we have a big brain in comparison to our body size it's also that it has a lot of folds and stuff but mm -hmm. most humans tend to have a similar ish size brain and we tend to be able to cognitively do similar ish things so what is the variation in brain size in humans 
in these papers saying so like what was one of them you said like iconicity are we are is it is it comparing species or is it i don't understand well i think it's i you know if i were on the shield database right now i would actually click on that link and find out it would take me to the paper where it would actually tell what they were on about because to be honest i I'm think you have homework not quite sure <laughs> iconicity go find that paper but let me just read through some of these points um having a bigger brain correlates with larger social groups and dunbar robin dunbar in the oxford handbook of language evolution has pointed out that when you get larger social groups you also get larger vocal repertoires not just in humans but in primate species and in chickadees both wild and captive which was interesting because you need to communicate more meanings you need to have more different kinds of signals you can send so you need to have a bigger like vocal tract to send those this is the thing right about that humans compared to a lot of other primates have a vocal tract that is sort of bigger and can make more distinctive sounds but also, right, it, we have an easier time to choke on food. We're getting there. We're getting there in the 10 million. <laughs> okay. okay. So, yes, I will. Ben, you've mentioned, you've mentioned Robin Dunbar's primate group size hypothesis before. Do you remember what you were saying about that? This was many episodes ago. Oh, okay. Robert Dunbar's primate group size hypothesis. Um, is, this, is this related to the, um, the something number? Like that, like human beings basically can only function up to a certain number of, of social contacts. And beyond that number, our brain just kind of like does a backflip and then explodes, which is part of the reason why in the modern era, we are all so miserable and anxious all the time because we're connected to like way too many people. Yep. <laughs> okay. Cool. This yeah. is something that uh, Robin Dunbar sort of hypothesized. It's, it's a bit speculative. Dunbar admits this, but um, Dunbar noticed that as the brain size goes up so does the number of people in your monkey sphere and the number of people in your like social that. group uh, and for humans that would be something like 200 plus or minus 50. 200 individuals. And, and the argument i've heard this played out as and I, I think this is someone taking dunbar's work beyond that point is basically like if we live in communities with meaningful connections above the 150 200 number it doesn't work super well Apes use grooming to maintain social connections, but grooming 200 people would take a super long time. Dunbar estimates about 42% of all your time. Way too time consuming, but talking to that many people is manageable. So Dunbar asserts that language is the functional equivalent of grooming for humans. And this is evidenced by the fact that about two thirds of our talk is social and only 10% procedural. Hedvig. I just think that another difference between other primates and humans is that we can have different types of relationships mm. and that it is hard to have 200 best friends, ah. but you could have 10 best friends, 50 work colleagues, uh, 10 people you sometimes see on the bus. Like I feel like my relationships are quite different and that I try and pay conscious attention to that hmm. and sort of they take up different like space in my brain because of that um, i'm not sure how many frenemies the average chimp has but i'm very sure that i have more <laughs> frenemies yeah yeah like we we have we have and we we have like our ability our imagination and our ability to f fantasize and stuff like i went out for coffee with a friend of mine that i haven't seen in like 10 plus years and I don't think about her every day normally, but I remember her and now our relationship picks up. So she doesn't, she doesn't take up my 200 space all the time, but I can, when I see her, reattach. And I feel like that's quite different from, like I feel sometimes when we say like, oh, your village can only be 200 people, we sort of forget. Do you think, Hedvig, that it's possible that you, because you are, a, and I say this with so much love in my heart, because you are fundamentally a dumb monkey, like the rest of us, uh, but you live uh -huh. in a modern world beyond the capabilities of the dumb monkeys that we all evolved to be, that you're like mm -hmm. hot desking 
human <laughs> connections in your head because you, you're still constrained by this 200 number, but you are like, have to make it work. So you're just like, okay, all right, you 10. Yeah, I haven't seen you in a while. So you go down there and then, oh, look, there's a person I saw before, but you go back. And so it's just this constant, like, keep the plate spinning with the, with the 200 number. Maybe, but I feel like the 200 numbers, yeah, I feel like the different types of relationship means that it can't be 200 numbers and the hot desks aren't all the same. Like Christina doesn't take okay. up the same hot desk as my friend Angela. Right? Well, they it sounds can't. like you're saying the number's much smaller. Like your number's just like 50 and you just could need to keep swapping the 50. Mm, no, 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 I think it's still like 200 ish. <laughs> maybe it's maybe it's like active vocabulary versus passive vocabulary. There are words you can use, and then there are words you could recognize. I think there's people we know, and then there's people we recognize. So I don't. Know. True. I also think that you should you should I I can advise in general. It's good to know your type of relationship that you have with individual people and not expect more or less than that. Hmm. Does that make sense? Like Ben and Daniel are my podcast host friends. Um, I talk to them about certain things and I expect certain things of them, but they're not my uh, all-purpose best friends that I can do everything with. And no one is. Hmm. It is wisdom. Okay, All right. Over Hedvig therapy thought talk is <laughs> what over. I, what I love is like one of Hedvig's BFFs is like listening to this show and just sl silently like weeping as they realize that she doesn't think of them in that way. <laughs> <laughs> no one is like that. <laughs> No one, no I'm, I'm just teasing. I, you, you are absolutely correct. I know. Yeah, okay. Let's get away from right. Dunbar for a second and talk about the effect okay. of bigger brains on reproduction. Okay. Oh, no. So, I have multiple. I am 35. I have multiple friends the last 10 years who have or are about to give birth. And I can tell you that the fact that we have the, 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 the brain size we do and the heads we do and the uprightness of we do causes a lot of pain in childbirth. It does. It comes with advantages, but it certainly comes with some disadvantages. So having a bigger brain on average will give you greater cognitive capacity. You can have greater capacity for abstract symbolic manipulation. Babies got huge heads. They, oh, yep. They just, I mean, and the way we get them out helps a little bit because their heads are kind of squashy at first. But yeah, birth is a difficult thing. So... One strategy that humans seem to have gotten is get them out early. Just, just listeners, just so we're clear, Daniel means that sort of relatively speaking. Relatively he doesn't mean that like humans now are trying to get them out really early. He means no, no, just no. like human beings have evolved a strategy of when we give birth, our young are still quite not there yet. I'm saying that when a giraffe is born, it falls from a height of two meters and then it can run away. Okay. Yep. Babies are, human babies are very immature. They're vulnerable. But remember, you're in a large social group and that can help you to care for immature young until they're able to look after themselves. So it, that locks Which we together. see in other animals that exist in social groups as well. Hmm. Do you know, like, kangaroos are so crazy, like marsupials. They give birth to very, Oh, they've taken that strategy very, to the extreme. Oh, yeah. They give birth to very, very immature young. And the first thing that little marsupial babies do when they come out of the uterus is climb up the mother and into the pouch. And then they attach. And the uterus is essentially like a second. Uh, the, 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 the pouch, the pouch is, is a second uterus. A second uterus. And they stay there for a longer time. So they actually just stay sort of they're like double, double cooked. <laughs> they they're are. Blind, they're blind baked like a pie. They're biscuits. They are so so useless. They are arguably maybe even more useless than humans when they get born the first time. When they get born the second time, they seem to be more like giraffes. But well, they the get first to time, be born a bunch of times, right? Like, like, so they get born out of the uterus, but then when they're in the pouch, they can just like come and go as they please. It's like an open door policy. But not the first couple of months. They attach. Did you yes, know they actually yeah. skin attach to their mother's nipples? Yeah. I did know that. Yeah. 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 yeah, they can't remove. Well, we know that everything was in place body-wise by 100, 200 to 100,000 years ago, something like that. But boy, the, the web of language here is so complicated. By this point, the human body had reached the stage where communication was possible. Also, another interesting thing about if we're talking about this again, there's a great paper by um, Nick Evans from a couple years ago about when we think about the origins of language, we sometimes think like, oh, there was one language and it spread or language got invented multiple times. 
but humans and most species are really good at variation and he makes out the point that like maybe we have been multilingual like whatever multiple languages mean at that point maybe we have been multilingual all along maybe we always had variation in the system so it's not like one group one language even at this time language games well, i think that i think that i i often think about how diverse um accents can be <laughs> in places that have had one language for a long time and so because i'm an anglo person i think about this in terms of the uk right and you can mm -hmm. have two different people from different parts of the uk which in a contemporary conception are like no more than a couple of hours from each other by car but have a accent so divergent that it is entirely possible not to fully be able to grasp what one or the other is saying if we think about that in terms of like prehistory right where human beings were shackled to the amount of distance they could easily walk in a couple of days of course of course we had like this wild variation because this this we're talking about a time frame of like thousands and thousands of years as well that's the other thing um we had the languages of the uk like the accents in the uk after a couple of hundred years imagine imagine the level of variation and dare i say it's speciation of language when you're talking about like divergent groups who really couldn't probably like a mountain range is like an insurmountable thing for everyday travel potentially and people lived on the other side of mountain ranges mm -hmm. But that's even taking into account the idea of isolation. Now we're talking even people who aren't isolated from each other, like people within the same village Whoa. speaking differently, right? <laughs> so because that happens today, people, families speak multiple languages in one family at home. People move around, people, so like there's no reason, this idea of like one group, one village having some sort of normative, uh, like striving towards homogeneity, is not necessarily the case and humans are really good at variation this is why um i've been it's fun teaching this course but like humans are really good at variation and the fact that we don't use it more is like or really bad depending on what your perspective is yeah. <laughs> like we're really bad in that we variate all the time oh. <laughs> no no we're very good at like dealing with variation like oh, okay. yeah that, we can handle a lot more you we can handle yeah that's the thing like we 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 are like how, what's the what's the likeness like we are spinning one plate on one stick where we could be spinning like four <laughs> well, you're spinning a lot yeah. more than that Hedvig. i'm spinning one plate and i'm only doing that one kind of half ass i'm not but... spinning as many as i could for sure no you're spinning a couple <laughs> of plates too ben because nobody speaks with the same style all day long we're switching between oh, different styles stop there are different social accents in perth mm. they're, they're just all mm. over the place but now it's time to hop back into the time machine quick. Let's get away from 1 million years and go back to 10 million years ago. Beep, boop, beep, beep, boop, boop. Gorillas speciated about 10 million years ago. Chimps, 7 million years ago. We're not talking about having language at this point, although communication is very likely. We were still getting ready. Our brains were doing their thing. But even now, we can start seeing ways in which our bodies were getting ready for language. And one of the things was mirror neurons. We don't talk much about mirror neurons anymore. I can't remember the last time I heard about mirror neurons. But for example, when I, I used to do a demonstration, I take a knife, I'll, I'll do it. Oh, knife? Ooh, what's gonna happen? <laughs> I'm not enjoying this. So I've got this knife, this kitchen knife, and I'm poking it into my hand. And as I poke it into my hand, I've got neurons in my brain that are firing, saying there's a knife poking into my hand. But you watching me, there's a similar part of your brain that's firing as well, just watching me. Mm -hmm. It's sort of mirroring mm -hmm. what I'm doing. And if you talk to Michael Arbib, who is the, he was the big one about mirror neurons, he talked about grasping. I'm using part of my brain to grasp with my hand, but when you see me grasp the same part of your brain, the mirror neurons in that part of your brain are operating too. It's detectable. This is why it's really hard to watch TV shows with social awkwardness. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you and I were on exactly the same page there. Steelers Peep Show, a British show that is very, very hard for me to watch. Yeah, I know. Oh, Peep Show is hard. Faulty Towers. Because my, all of the things 
No, Faulty Towers is fine. Uh, Peep <laughs> Show is... for me! <laughs> yeah. Peep oh, Show God, is, is you tough. can't... Oh, okay. oh, wow. I've been oh, watching... Daniel. I literally just a couple of days ago finally started to um, give Beef on Netflix a try, the Ali Wong, Steve Ewan one about yeah. two people who are in, like, a feud. And, and again, mm-hmm. it's not as bad as Peep Show, but just the level of human beings doing intensely difficult things and I just, I sit there, I, I get a... I break out in a flop sweat. Like, I just, I just, yeah. Go, <laughs> yeah. Thanks, mirror neurons. I watched Borat through my fingers, you know? Mm. Yeah. Yep. So, the idea is that mirror neurons helped us to do things like have empathy, to recognize other people's actions, and that means recognizing other people's intentions. And that means thinking, oh, this is someone who might be worthwhile to talk to or to understand or coordinate with we could see relevance in other people's actions. So Michael Arbib talks about the language-ready brain, where brain and body evolved in tandem. So that's one thing that was going on 10 million years ago. Another thing, bipedalism, which I'll just summarize the chart here. Basically, we were bipedal about 6 million years ago, and exclusively so 2 to 4 million years ago. And when you're walking on two legs, a couple of things happen. Number one, you got hands. You got hands. (laughs) So I can do tools and I can do gesture and I can do things that are good for my brain and are good for my communication. Another thing is that when you're walking on two legs, your vocal tract is not a tube that you sort of bark through. Your head is now facing forward. Your your vocal tract is now bent into an L shape. And what that means is here's the chart from Shields. Vocal tract links to three balloons here, biological constraints, I don't know, but also phoneme inventory size and lexical Mm. capacity. Hedvig, take this one because you were going there. This is the idea that um, if you have, if you're able to make more distinctions, you can, you know, distinguish between more different kinds of signals in your little game. And that's great because that, you know, your language can talk about more different things unambiguously. You can still have ambiguity. Um, but the idea that I've heard that everyone gets taught in like first year linguistics that I should actually look up the paper that says this is that it, um, the way our um, pharynx and our um, vocal folds works is such that because we can do all these things and the way our vocal folds work, we no longer can block the glottis so glottis is related to your lungs it connects your lungs to your vocal apparatus um and it it, it's yeah like um danny hassan's size is higher when you're a child and it descends but it has descended in such a way that um food can get down there yeah the air hose and the food hose cross yeah and we can accidentally get food into our glottis and then choke and die but Mm -hmm. it's worth it Right. Like it's one of those, it's like the big brain thing, right? It's a payoff. It's a trade-off. Yeah. Yeah. It's a payoff. So like being able to make more different sounds. Also, possibly there are more things than just more different sounds. It's like Daniel said, walking bipedally, there's, there's more things going on than just making more sounds maybe. Yeah. That's um, like a threefer. But, but when your vo- when your vocal yeah. track is an L shape, more things can touch other things. And so you can make lots of different sounds. And that means that you've got like 40 different sounds and you can have different words. And that means that, I mean, imagine what it's like when you have a language that has seven, no, wait, 11 phonemes. All the words have to be super duper long, which costs you True. in memory. But if you have lots or, of phonemes to choose alternatively, from- right, you have a smaller repertoire of things that you actually can say, right? Which, it's one of those two options. Which is fine too. Yeah. All right, so now what we've got is it's time to come back home to now. Now what we've got is a way to put ideas into other people's heads with arbitrary signs. We can communicate with people Mm -hmm. around the world. We can share, record and share language in ways that persist over time and space. And we use language to show identity and group membership. We use it to create and maintain social relations. We have language now. Mm -hmm. But now it's time to go ahead a little bit. A hundred years from now. Now, do you have any guesses as to how language is going to be different a hundred years from now? Because I put this to our pals on Discord. They've got some ideas. What do you reckon? I certainly have some ideas here, Daniel. All right, let's If I know one thing about the youth of today, it's that they don't bloody talk to each other anymore. No one says anything. They're all on their devices. English is going to the dogs. So so I would anticipate that in a hundred bloody years, language will be 
dead. I'm enjoying how Ben is using his accent to perform that character. <laughs> no, but I, I think that I hear a lot of pearl clutching sort of talk mm -hmm. on the part of people about young people today mm -hmm. and, and like their quote, inability to communicate and all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And I, f I find that talk really bad. <laughs> <laughs> you don't like it. I don't, I don't, I don't have a better, I don't have a better thing for it because like humans are, are language engines. Like it's just mm -hmm. what we do just because the way that a person is communicating might be different from the way that you're familiar with um, doesn't mean it's not language. Mm. And I think, yeah, any anything that is like, oh, people will, like will be speaking through like electronic implants in their head or whatever is like, okay, but like if let's say they did, let's say they were speaking through electronic implants in their head, they still have to be using language and that language is going to look a certain way. So yeah. like, how does it look? Hmm. I think that um, with technology, with the ability to direct message or make very casual register videos and script writing, it has changed the kinds of things that people can communicate over large distances. Like it used to be that you could just like send letters or write books and you you wrote in a sort of formal style, you can make more informally now. So the, the writing systems are, are changing. You can talk more informally to people far away. You can form a subcultural group with people that um, you've never Another met the world. Mm -hmm. in real life, right? So like, um, that's really powerful, I think. Social groups aren't restricted by uh, distance any anymore. And um, I think that with, with technology, with like spelling and stuff, it's hard to change how words are spelled, but I think they're mm -hmm. still gonna change in pronunciation. Yes. And I think that a lot of the times grammar things like syntax and especially ordering can change without people paying as much attention to it. So Swedish is a V2 language, meaning that in a sentence, your verb has to be in the second position. Mm. So if I say like, Hedvig has blue eyes, blue eyes has Hedvig. Okay. Anyway, um, I hear more and more young people, ch so children, for example, Swedish children don't acquire the V2 rule late. They actually don't do V2 first, which is fun. Wow. Okay. So it's like an arbitrary rule that has to be like beaten into you. Yeah. Oh. And immigrants struggle with it and young people struggle with this. So in the other day at Uppsala University in the coffee room, we were talking being like, hundred years from now, Swedish might no longer be V2. And it's a and everyone fun everyone was thing. like, woohoo. <laughs> everyone was like, yeah, it could happen. Because also the spell checks don't really catch it in the same way. Like if I misspell a word. Right, because it's, it's a tricky, well, given the fact that two linguists were really struggling to explain it, I can see <laughs> yeah. how a spell check would really struggle to pick it up. Speaking of spelling, do you think that in a hundred years, sound change in English will progress to an extent that it breaks English spelling and we need to fix it? I don't think we're going to fix it. I think we're just going to add more arbitrary rules that people are going to have yeah. to learn. A hundred percent. Okay. That's exactly what I anticipate happening. Okay. It's just going to be harder and harder to teach English. And what could also happen is if I'm like, there's a place around here called Bastema, and um, it is spelled with a D in it. It has never been pronounced with a D in it, but for stupid 1800 reasons, it's spelled with a D. So people are now starting to say Vabstema with a D. That has never been the place name. It's only stupid spelling. But people who aren't local to here don't know that. So they say, oh, I went to Vod Stena. And I think that can happen as well. So like people will start trying to pronounce the way it's written, even though it's never been pronounced. So there must way. be there must be a name for that because I have a version of that in English as well. Um, we have okay. a town in the north of Western Australia called Derby, D-E-R-B-Y. And every English person who comes to this place is just like, oh, you've got a Derby. You've got and a Derby. And, and so... Clearly, it must have been named after Derby, a place in England, or a name, because the name is pronounced the same way, even if it's spelt with an E. And, but, like, here in Australia, we were just like, oh, look, D-E-R-B-Y, Derby. <laughs> All good. Yeah. Do you reckon people will start talking about tropical islands? Yeah. Ah, uh, do you reckon? I don't know. I don't reckon. Maybe. I don't reckon. 
How about this? I, I let me let me go through this slide with the easy ones, and then I'm going to make a a pretty uh, wild, spicy take here. Oh, okay, big big calls. I like it. We know Bring that language is going to continue to change because all languages are doing that. Accents will change, but I think in a hundred years, the number of them are going to mostly hold steady. Like people are okay. saying, we're losing this and this accent, but no, we're not. It's just that what we consider that accent is changing. Uh, but we will be losing languages. The estimate is that maybe half of human languages will be gone within a hundred years. And that estimate, I've never seen that retracted. So unless we get busy. My spicy take is I think that world learner English is going to be a major force because there are so many people who are learning English and are semi in contact with the English speaking world. So is that is that like the like English as like the thousand easiest and simplest words kind of thing? I, people who are learning it. And I think that there, it, we're going to see two things. I think we're going to see uh, third person singular S as in John eats. I think it's going to drop out. And I think that we're not going to be so funny about subject verb agreement because we're going to have a billion people who just don't get it. And so we're going to loosen up a lot on that. It could also be that we um, extrapolate the S to all the other ones. So I eat. Oh, maybe. maybe. Oh, yeah. The subject verb agreement yeah. thing is where you go. Uh, many people likes chocolate. Okay. Many people was happy. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. Gotcha. gotcha. And it's a thing like I experienced it myself because it's a thing of when we talk about evolutionary stuff again, it only changes if you get enough input. And I have listened to our podcast recordings and I will often um, randomly pick between was and were. And none of you two ever misunderstand me. So mm -hmm. I'm not going to change. <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> like I've, I've often said that there doesn't need to be spelled three ways because we can differentiate it fine when we speak. So yeah. we probably could when we wrote it as well. My spicy take um, is, and I think this just speaks to my own psychology rather than any actual informed guessing on my part. A um, hundred years is a long time, yep. right? I, I think we don't think it is. Like, I think a lot of people still exist in the, like, we are at the end of history kind of phase of human existence. And I think that within a hundred years, we could potentially see the end to a couple of different things. We could see the end to late stage neoliberalism, capitalism, as we currently see it in the world today. I think enough horrendous, terrible fucking things could go down that a bunch of people around the world be like, let's try something else. Um, so A, B, I think we could, and we may well be in the process of seeing the end of American cultural influence in the Anglosphere as well, yeah. which I think the death of the American cultural influence in the Anglosphere could largely mean the death of the influence of the Anglosphere full stop. Hmm. Um, because if the dominant, say, cultural and economic force pivots to be the EU, English is absolutely not the language of the EU. Um, and what we might see is like a, a proliferation or a, a splintering of, because at the moment globally, you very much do sort of exist in a world where to learn English is to learn the language of social and financial um, sort of upward mobility. And I think we might see that not be the case by a hundred years. And then people might pivot to like, if you're in the Asia Pacific, potentially learning like uh, Mandarin or Hindi or something like that might make more sense to you. If you live in Europe, maybe learning French or German or some other sort of large economic powerhouse of the union might make more sense to you. And, and we can, because of that, I think the sort of monolingualistic force of English might go away to a greater or a lesser extent, which like, yay, death, death to the English. <laughs> <laughs> Let me just read some of the comments from our uh, listeners and friends. Angry Balls says, in 100 years, Spanish will have replaced English as a global language. Ooh, big call. More people will be fighting to protect their minority languages. Angry Balls says Spanish, right. I think French. Because Africa. Oh, no, French had its time. No, it's going to it's, it's come back. I've been going through our old Talk the Talk episodes, and we've got a future of French episode. And the fact that most of the population is going to be coming out of Africa in the next hundred years means French is going to have a resurgence in some form. But 
but what a, <laughs> wait Look. sorry there's different things here there's like the death of anglo cultural um hegemony but in the eu and in nigeria a lot of people speak a variety yeah. of english right uh, are we talking about uh, what nigerian nigerian Niger? pidgin english or Niger. Uh, yeah like Nigerian Pidgin English or or like uh, how, like Europeans, we talk English to each other, even though none of us have as a native language and we speak a kind of European English that's different from American English, right? If I want to get a job in the EU, I might not need to like learn German or French, but I might need to learn like European English. I will concede that point, although I will point out that Niger is not English. It's an English based Creole, but yes, that's not. A big deal in the, the the grand scheme of like english-based language varieties yes it yes. doesn't have to be french and also west african french is the better french so i would be happy <laughs> to have this. okay it is all right oh what i love about that is how much french like as in the country french speakers will just hate they you would just saying. hate that <laughs> just hate you so much and anything that angers the french is okay by me Pharaohcat says, in 100 years, I feel like a lot of er and ol will swap, like or so for also. Australian English will become more rhotic. This one has a chance. Whoa, Australian English becoming more rhotic. That is a big call. Well, rhoticity is the kind of thing that can and does flip over 100 years. It did in New York City, where in the 1700s, the R version was more prestigious than in the 1800s. The R-less version was more prestigious, and now it's back to R. So... That's, ah, oh, I think we've discovered like a personal trigger of mine because oh. my, 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 my insides hurt when you said that. I was just oh. like, nope, no hard R in Australia. <laughs> now let's take it to a thousand years from now. Now, remember a thousand years ago, we had old English, which is really, really tough for us to decipher. Yeah. Unless you know what you're doing. Will modern English be un as unrecognizable as old English is to us, or will writing preserve it? Unrecognizable, I vote. It's not just writing either. It's also like, I think I think sometimes people forget that like TV, and films, mm -hmm. and podcasts are things that people use to spread linguistic innovations and patterns. Like we don't have sitcoms from a thousand years ago, but do you think that people like I watch some films from the 1950s sometimes. Do you think people a thousand years from now would be interested? OK, do you think people 200 years from now would be interested in watching Friends? I don't that's know. an interesting that's a really interesting question. Uh, I think so. Oh, would the humor even not, make right? sense? Think, humor is we'll be, socially situated. Yeah. Not only that, but like we have access to books that are 200 years old, but only a very tiny minority of people actually regularly read books that old, right? That's just that. Yeah. That, that's true, right? Like for, mm -hmm. if you were to measure how many people have read the full collection of like Charles Dickens or Jane Austen or whatever mm -hmm. and judge that by the average population, that, like that would There are so many stands. Oh, my God. There are so many Austen stands. No, there's vocal stands. There's not so many of them. It's not the same thing. And also many, many, what does many mean? Like there are yeah. more than a handful of them. Yes, Daniel. But, but there's also 7 billion people in the world. <laughs> well, Hedvig, do you think that, right. uh, do you think that media will form an anchoring effect? That's what I'm trying to say. But also that media changes. So like we talked about like Jane Austen and stuff, like in 1800s is where we get the development of the novel as a thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right? Like a novel is not a thing that has always existed. If you try and read Gilgamesh, you will notice it's not a novel. And those guys were doing it differently even then, right? Like Dickens famously yeah. would serialize his novels first so we could get the payday out of that and then he'd publish it as a book. Mm. Right. Yeah. Let's go to the next one. The one thing that people say to me is, oh, I think that English is going to be like the only language in the world. So. Will English be the only world language with minor variations or will uh, another language dominate or will it just be lots of languages all over the place? Lots of a handful of languages. Like, so we're still talking about 7,000 languages reducing down to a much smaller number that are actively spoken and used. Mm -hmm. And we were talking about, like, oh, it's going to be French or Spanish or English or German or Mandarin or Hindi. 
like even if it was all of those, that's like 10, mm -hmm. right? 10 compared to 7,000 is like a lot smaller. <laughs> even if you don't like math, <laughs> you can tell that 10 is a smaller number than 7,000. One um, thing that I think about a lot is that a lot of the stuff that sits behind people being like, oh, we're, we're just going to have one language, right? Is, is this idea that globalization is a thing that can only ever become more that, right? Like, like there is this unified direction of greater levels of interconnectivity and, and all that kind of stuff. Um, that's not at all true or guaranteed mm. by any stretch mm -hmm. of the imagination. Mm -hmm. And even today we can look around the world and we can see a significant sort of like, if not a backslide, certainly a significant slowing down on a lot of the mechanisms that people would describe as globalization, right? We are seeing a return to like big power politics on the part of places like America and Russia and China. We are seeing like there've, there've been like seven coups in West Africa in the last two years. There is significant social unrest in significant parts of the world. Like, it is not a lock that the world is going to always be this, like, happy, clappy, kumbaya, like, oh, in 150, 200, 300, 400 years, everyone's going to speak the same language and there'll be no borders and it'll be this amazing. But no, yeah. <laughs> probably not. Yeah, It probably won't. And we see people not being as shackled or like scared of Western state homogeny. Like we see, for example, last couple of weeks, uh, member states from the global south speaking out and condemning Israel without uh, being, uh, you know, without the, the, and not being as scared of America as you'd think they'd be, <laughs> yeah. right? Which is like new. Definitely. That mm. is new. <laughs> And I was just going to see about uh, about subcultures, being a person who grew up with a lot of like various like subcultures, um, memes and talk communities and 4chan and stuff like people are forming smaller social groups all the time mm -hmm. and they develop conventionalized styles and people are able to participate in most of those at the same time. So. Okay. Let's go right. to our listeners. Pharaoh Cat says, in 1,000 years, our language will be as incomprehensible as Old English is to us today. So that's taking, I agree. taking that view. Uh, Angry yep. Ball says, in 1,000 years, their equivalent of the internet will have developed one or several languages of its own, separate Thanks. from spoken language. Also, mass exodus and casualties caused by the climate catastrophe will be visible in the historical record of spoken languages. I think that's a really good that, that, you know, if there's a black yeah. swan event or if there's a catastrophe for humans, it's going to show up in language. Definitely. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, digital dark age. I, I, um, I'm going to talk about this as, as 10, 1000, but also 10,000 years from now. Um, okay. if somebody gave me a floppy disk and I still have floppy disks, but I have literally no idea how to read them. And we need to be aware of this might be an age where all of the language that we have, all of the corpora that we've built up will just get lost or missing just due to disuse or unreadable. Well, 10,000 years from now, it's really tricky. It could be that technological progress will change the way we use language entirely. Will we use something else? I don't think so. I think we're still going to be using language. Um, 10,000 years ago, we had Proto-Indo-European and a bunch of Proto-language families. Is it possible that the human language family tree will look like English at the top of a tree with other sub... Um, will, will, will English be its own language family and French will be its own language family and whatever? Oh, that's interesting, right? Like you've got this idea that Proto-Indo-European is, is the progenitor of like this huge chunky trunk of language tree. Mm but not because it's inherently good, but because all of the other languages died. Mm. <laughs> and so, and so well, like, maybe we won't win whatever bottleneck event, whatever cataclysmic, awful thing happens, right? In 10,000 years, maybe we've colonized space and Earth is a vaguely inhabitable but mostly terrifying rock and everyone in space <laughs> is speaking some modern version or some space far, far adapted version yeah of like chinese or um chinese of mandarin or, or space pigeon yep absolutely yep. but probably 
if if in the future as it is now geographical distances are more easily overcome then also maybe cultural history and language history isn't meaningfully construed in a tree model at all <sighs> yeah true so i also like the idea that in 10,000 years there's going to be people just finding the bones of our civilization right and 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 coming across like great huge gargantuan things and just being like what the fuck were these people doing like mm -hmm. what is this well that's what angry balls says in 10,000 years the world will be different from how it is now in every way possible if humans still exist languages will be unrecognizable as the 21st century will have been the beginning of a long period of digitization that left no archaeological record other than plastic mm. packaging you will still be able to find some latin here and there but most archaeology will be done through rummaging for well-preserved detritus and a few data storage devices and ignacio echoes that i have this horrible recurring thought after we have digitized the whole of human knowledge then post the next catastrophe no one will actually be able to access the knowledge because they won't have the right adapter or charger or something or it just won't exist right like we don't currently have the technology to keep data good for ten thousand years <laughs> like that that doesn't exist. Yep. They have pretty like so at uh, the this um, the big seed bank up in Svalbard where they store a bunch of things. They also store digital information and they don't use USB C drives or anything. They use like a fancy kind of film thing. Like th they are trying to think of things that will last longer but than the devices I, you have I'm, in your home. I'm sure. I'm sure they are, and I'm sure some really smart people out there are trying really hard. But didn't the seed bank start like flooding a couple of years ago? Like, like, because they never expected it to get warm and then it started getting warm. Like, what I, w I guess what I'm trying to ask is, does the thing that they've invented be good if it gets submerged in water for 10,000 years? <laughs> One suggestion from the Long Now project is that we take discs of nickel or plates of nickel and we etch writings onto them that would be readable by a medium power microscope. Okay. That's one so possible. literally just actual, st like stone tablets, but on a very small scale. And we know that the uh, seed repository was melted because Grandmaster Glitch got in and the Go-Jetters couldn't stop him in time. <laughs> oh, God. Sorry, Go-Jetters reference. Daniel. Daniel. With that, no. we've got to take the, the linguistic time machine back. i got to vacuum it out before I return it. They're going to kill me. <laughs> we put so many years on it. Oh, my gosh. But well, what we've seen so far is the brain, body, and culture have come together to make human language over a long period of time. We got a lot of ways of finding out about what language is like. And when we see language at the time scales that we've been looking at, we can see that it's actually looking at it is much more fun than complaining or fretting about how language should be. And those prescriptive concerns seem quite small and petty at this time distance. And we'll just close by oh, yeah. saying, the two things I always say, it's normal for language to change and it's normal for people to use language differently. Final thoughts? Bring on the changes. Um, I feel like I need to say something uplifting because we ended in a bit of a potentially <laughs> dark space. And I think that humans are, can be dicks, but we are generally really, like most of us, most of the time, are quite, I would describe it as cute. Like we're trying to connect with each other. We have little like <laughs> electricity flying in our brains and we're like, I'm going to vibrate my floppy bits in my head to make similar electric things fire in your head. And there's something just very sweet about that. And I think that very, very fundamental things to our species and even to like a lot of other mammals in general and even animals that aren't mammals and even plants is that we're trying to connect. We're trying to form groups because groups is how we how we get through this shit, right? Mm -hmm. And I just think humans are really cute. Humans are cute, but they're also really tenacious and good adapters. And I think the language abilities we have are stronger than the forces that are against us. I think if there's humans, there's going to be human language. I Yeah, I think that's a uncontroversial but potentially not very satisfying end to the Well, episode. I was trying for uplifting, so go ahead, yeah, Ben. You give us your try. You uplift oh, us. No, 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 no. We've had, we've had two very nice, warm, cute, fuzzy, and look, what I'll say is that 
what Daniel said was absolutely true. If there's going to be human beings, then we're going to be talking. And if, like, whatever form talking looks like. Um, and just like the bats in the cave, a huge amount of that talking is probably going to be complaining as we get people to get their butts out of our face and all the rest of it. Um, but that's part of being a human being too, is having a good old whinge. So I think we will have language to whinge with in 10,000 years' time. It just won't look anything like the whinging we do today. Lily Tomlin said that. She said, I believe that humans invented language out of a deep-seated need to complain. 100%. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, I would just like to say a big thank you to Speech Docs, who transcribe all of our words, to our patrons, who keep the show going. Thank you for being here and joining us on this journey. Ben and Hedvig, thank you so much for come, making time to come and chat with me. This has been a lot of fun, and I just really look forward to our chats. Thanks for all you bring. As a podcast passenger princess, yes. um, I I think you should make a whole bunch more lecture series. Just do, do do that work, Daniel. You could probably use ChatGPT to do a lot of the grind for you. And you can just like, uh, this is great. I think you should do more of these that people can watch online and have like a fun little time. I like it. That is it. Yep. All right. Hey, thank you for being patrons and supporting Because Language. But just for anyone who doesn't know, here are some ways you can do it. You can tell a friend about us or leave a review in all the places where you can leave reviews. You can follow us. You know, we'd be lost without the feedback and input from our listeners. So we're Because Langpod in all of the places. If you want to leave us a voice message that we can play on the show, you can do that with SpeakPipe on our website, becauselanguage.com. You can even email us a file of your voice. We'd love to have it. Or don't even use your voice. Just send us ideas. Lots of people do that. That's hello at becauselanguage.com. You can also, if you are feeling particularly patronly, become a patron yourself. You get like special episodes as they're recorded instead of like whenever Daniel gets around to releasing them to the general public. You uh, you put money towards uh, transcribing all of our shows so that um, everything that we've said is like searchable. So if you have ever find yourself stuck in one of those like pub conversations where you're like, no, 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 I know it, you can actually like. <laughs> Control F your way to the right answer that you heard in our show and then get back to your friend and be like, and another thing. Um, you get like bonus mail outs, you get to participate in our live episodes, you get to sit in and watch the magic slash not magic happen, and you also get to be part of our Discord, which is just full of really great, nerdy, in the best possible way, humans. Um, and I'm going to shout out to some of those nerdy, in the best possible way, humans right now. Jeremy, Elias, Matt, Whitney, Helen, Jack, Farrowcat, Lord, Lord Mortis, Mortis, Lisa, Grammar Yen, Renee, Christopher, Andy, James, Nigel, Meredith, Kate, Nazarin, Joanna, Nikolai, Keith, Aisha, Steele, Margareth, Manu, Diego, Aria Flame, Roger, Rianne, Colleen, Ignacio, Kevin, Andy from Logophilius, Stan, Kathy, Rash, Cheyenne, Felicity, Amir, Kenny Archer, Oh, oh Tim. Tim. Alyssa, Chris, Angry Balls, Tyg, Luis, Reiner, and our new patron at the friend level, Itamar. Hey, Itamar, you are great. Welcome. And our theme music was written and performed by Drew Papiano, who also performs with Ryan Bino and Didion's Bible. Thanks for listening. We'll catch you next time. Because language. Pew, pew, pew. Thanks, everybody. I am currently reading a what well, can only be described as a Neanderthal-based romance book series and having a great time. So the, I'm really the cave keen. people. Um, yeah, the cave bear. yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, mm. of course. Traditional. Traditional women's reading, not men's reading. Interesting. Well, as as you would find, as you contain your surprise, my partner was like, you should try this out. And I was like, okay. And then I did. I was like, oh, it's so sexy and exciting. I like it. <laughs> this is Clan of the Cave Bear? Yeah. Earth's Children series, I believe, is its official. It was assigned to me to read in high school. Wait, in America, in a Mormon yep. environment? Yep. Well, is not it... a Mormon environment. To be fair, though, that first book, entirely devoid of, like, I don't know what happened to Jeanne de whatever, but, like, she wrote a book and then they were like, oh, write some more. And she was like, okay, but this time, all the vagina. So much vagina. <laughs> Amazing. Well, I think I'm going to start on that note with uh, the intro for the show. Let's go. All the vagina. Cue intro music.